small business there, and for the last 15 or so years, uh, we worked on finding places around the Northeast, a lot of them in Vermont, to put large wind turbines. We also had some work with the state where we monitored small wind turbines, the type you see at, at residences. But most of our work is with large wind turbines. So I thought I'd bring a presentation along that would give you folks an idea of, of what it is we do and what large wind turbines look like. And at the end of the presentation, uh, I have uh, I put in several photographs here this morning of the wind project that we just completed managing up uh, in Georgia and Milton, Vermont, because that's a new one, uh, and the machines are the largest in the state, second largest in the state. Mm -hmm. um, my business actually has like two different names, and this is an old presentation. We go by Northeast Wind these days. We used to go by Vermont Environmental Research Associates. Same place, same people. What we do is we're in the wind siting business. We find sites for wind turbines, and once we find sites, we evaluate them, and then we work with the banks and financiers to get wind projects installed. One of the first things we do is to do a wind resource assessment. That's just essentially figuring out how hard the wind's blowing at a site. And that makes a lot of difference because it will spell the success or the failure of a project depending on how much wind you have and you have to estimate that accurately. Um, I didn't get into this business specifically for wind power, but it's evolved that way over the last 25 years, and I'm sticking, uh, I'm sticking with it. Uh, I did say we work in the Northeast. Uh, primarily, we're working in Massachusetts now and Vermont. The site evaluation, uh, as I mentioned, wind is very important. Um, earlier, when I first started this business, the way we located windy sites, one of the ways we located windy sites, was to look at the wind-formed vegetation. And here you can see how these trees, these are white pine trees, like we have here in the Champlain Valley, uh, have over their lifetime reacted to a strong and steady wind coming from this direction. And you see how they're brushed or flagged. And that was one of the best ways we knew of to locate the windy sites. When you go up to the top of the mountains, where it's almost always windy, you see this very frequently. And one of the things that I learned early on was that the strength of the wind and how hard it blows and how long it blows, how persistently it blows, is related to how high you are above sea level, how high you can get on a hill or mountain. The higher the windier. And this is a line that shows that relationship. This is the highest mountain. Uh, in New England. This is Mount Washington, and these are measured wind speeds. This is Burlington, Vermont, about where we are here. And we would like to be here, but there's not too many sites up this high. So where we end up being is in this area here, around 2,500 to 3,000 feet in elevation. And to put that in perspective, that's not as high as Mount Mansfield or Campbell's Hump. It's less than that. But we always try to get to the higher grounds because the winds are strongest there. Uh, 
is the other thing we have to do is once we find a windy spot, we need to measure the winds and we need to do other sort of studies and we also need to get permission or rights to use the land for those purposes and eventually for uh, a wind turbine. Um, first thing we do is we put up a wind measurement tower and you might have seen you know, some of these around they're just small they're about this big in diameter at the base um, but this is a vehicle here you can see this one is about 40 meters tall about 130 feet tall we work with the landowners and we work with the local community to get them up to speed as to what we would like to do and to learn what they have to say and uh, and what their concerns may be. This the contraption here is part of the studies we did up on Georgia Mountain that's actually um, a radar unit. It's, um, it's like a weather radar except what it's doing is it's monitoring birds migrating over the site because we've learned that wind turbines and migrating birds in particular um, need to be studied very carefully and so we install radar equipment to do that. And the idea is there's a lot of studies that go on in the field and in my office to figure out how good of a site this really is. There's another measurement tower. This one's up on Lowell Mountain. The other thing that uh, is surprising to some, I guess, is it takes a while to go through all this process that we go through. The wind measurement period itself can last two to five years. So when we're approached by a landowner or a utility company or another entity that wants to put up a wind farm, they're not talking to us because they want to do it next month. They're talking to us because five to ten years from now. So it's a longer process to do this than, um, than many people would like. As we measure the winds, we begin to get a lot of data, a lot of numbers over time. And this is a chart of the daily wind speeds and you can see the variation or these are hourly over a period of days and you can see how the wind is very variable over that time and you know that just from living here in Vermont some days it's calm and other days it's windy as heck uh, we would like to see the wind all the time up there but it's not this is a pattern that's common in New England we also have another type of chart that shows us what direction the winds are coming from. And the length of these lines is related to the amount of time the wind is blowing this direction from the northwest. So in this particular site, over this period of time, that you can see there's a that most of the winds are from the northwest, very little wind from the south east. There's also a couple common sense things here that uh, come into play right off and that is if you're going to put up an electric generating facility, any of them, but a wind generating facility, you have to look for sites that not only do they have wind or strong winds, but you're also going to have to plug them into the electric grid out there, into the power lines. So you're going to want to look for windy sites that are close to existing power lines. And similarly to roads. This is Lowell Mountain where the Kingdom Community the project was placed in service this past year and here you have a transmission line right at the base of the mountain along the road 
and you have a road that you can bring large equipment in on. That combination begins to make it work, assuming at the top of the mountain you've got strong and persistent winds. Similarly, this is uh, this is Georgia Mountain up up north of here in Milton. Here there's a transmission line right along the road, and there's a road uh, within several miles to the top of the mountain. So that combination worked up there too. And if you look at all the other sites in Vermont, there's probably five now that have wind turbines on them. They all have those characteristics. Roads are expensive to build. They have their own environmental impacts. So are power lines. I'll just move. In terms of the environmental issues, there's there's some that are unique to wind power uh, because you're putting big rotating machines in the air, and then there's some that result from construction of anything in general. But one of the ones that we study right off once we get an understanding of the winds is that we study the potential impacts on wildlife and uh, if we're close to areas that are protected and people have placed easements on them to keep them wild and there are a lot of those areas in, uh, in New England Wind turbines also make sound, and um, people view whether the sound they make is interesting or not a problem to some people think they don't want to be listening to these sounds. So to <coughs> evaluate our site, we want to get the wind turbines at a location that are going to be far enough away from where people's residence are, where they live, so that any sound that they make isn't going to be an uh, annoyance to them. Uh, those actually aren't wind turbines. This is the Georgia Mountain Project. You'll see it later. These are that's um, a simulation. Those aren't the real turbines. The real turbines are very close to that. Um, and of course, there's the visual impact, also called aesthetic impact. And that is, you get, you can't hide this generating technology. It's clean and it's got the advantages of not polluting. But you see them, and then in Vermont, you usually end up putting them on mountain tops, and that makes them more visible. Some people don't like things uh, in uh, on top of their mountain tops. They'd rather see them without wind turbines. And others, quite frankly, just think they're great. And uh, when I travel around over the state, um, I hear both sides of it, and I hear it pretty much constantly. It's it's a uh, it's a discussion topic that people like to have. Uh, I personally think they look beautiful. I'm in the business too. And then we also do an economic analysis. We figure out if this is going to be a good business proposition. Given everything we've learned about the wind, about the impacts, can we really make this project work economically? Um, I, I made this slide to show there's, there is areas that are better for wind power development in Vermont than others. Uh, on the favorable side, agricultural areas, forest products production, uh, that can continue with wind turbines. You don't take a forest out of production. You do have to remove a couple of trees, of course, but logging can continue. 
Similarly, in agricultural lands, you can continue with farming and other agricultural uses. Um, the rural landscape is a benefit because large wind turbines can't or shouldn't be sited um, close to where people are living. I mentioned sound, but there's also safety issues too. There's also safety reasons. And so in Vermont, that we have a lot of those areas. Um, the less favorable are areas, uh, these are protected areas, wilderness areas. Again, those are the areas that people would like to see um, saved in their natural state and not developed. So those aren't favorable. Uh, it, I'm, I'm usually asked about ski areas. Why don't you put wind turbines in ski areas? Um, and in Vermont, we have several ski areas, you know, so, and I've been to most of them. Um, the reason is because of safety reasons. If you go to ski areas that are up on mountaintops, you usually have a lot of ice in the winter, and ice accumulates on the blades, and when it gets warm, like it is getting out there this afternoon, the ice will um, and melt off the blades and it will fall to the ground or get thrown out over an area. Well, if that's a ski trail, there's going to be problems there. And quite frankly, there's very few ski areas that um, I'm aware of that are actually safe places for wind turbines. <clears throat> and then if you are in build-up areas or you have a special area for its visual characteristics, those are usually not good areas to develop or think about developing for wind power either. But to look over a large area like the state of Vermont, we use a geographic information system called GIS. It's a computer-based system. Maybe you have seen some of it. If you do uh, have Google Earth, that's, that's similar. But it allows us to, using computers, electronically evaluate large land areas relatively quickly and, and categorize them according to certain factors or criteria that would make uh, certain areas more attractive for wind power development um, than others. And you can turn these layers on and off. You can actually have the computer produce tables and do various rankings. Um, the, the green areas here are protected lands that can't be developed, so it'll screen those out. And the, if you can see it, there's white areas here that aren't shaded at all. And that's um, where the existing power grid is. And remember I said you want there to be power nearby. So power lines are running down these quarters that are white. So the gray areas are usually too far away from power, and the green areas are restricted for other reasons. I'm sorry about that. I'm not quite sure whether that's going to come back on or not. I'm sort of waiting. Someone dialed 600, I think. Let's just get back to you on please. Okay. Um, we did this for the state of Vermont once to help out the people in Montpelier understand how much of Vermont could be acceptable using for wind development using pretty simple criteria. And we started out with a lot. Vermont's 9,577 square miles. That's what we started when we looked at the state. Of that only 273 have good wind resources. Of, 
of that 134 square miles are close to transmission and then outside of conserved areas, the green ones, you have 82. So you go down by a factor of 100 here. This is less than 1% of the total land area in Vermont is suitable for large wind development, using the analysis we did here, which is a small amount, but it allows you to, to focus what you're looking at a little more than you're just not looking at the 10,000 square miles, you're looking at less than 100. <clears throat> Here's just a blow off of uh, a certain part of the state, this is up around where we are, that shows where the windy areas are. These red lines are the windy areas. The green ones are, are ruled out for other reasons. And this is, I say there's 100 square miles, a little less than 100 square miles in all of Vermont. Well, they're in little pockets like this that are windy, and where there's no use restriction. But to look at that another way, uh, this is in terms of, it's not in square miles. The last chart I had was square miles. That's land area. What you're really looking at in Vermont is not land area. You're looking at length of ridge line because you're going to put these wind turbines up on a ridge line so they can get wind. This is just a depiction of the amount of ridge line that's available in all of Vermont, and then you reduce it because of environmental reasons, uh, and then you reduce it because of proximity to transmission lines, how close transmission lines is. It's the same analysis that I've been talking about, but what you end up with is that this square represents the whole state of Vermont. This little square in the corner is the good wind sites. Uh, there are four projects in the state. Uh, I've worked on all of them except for the one called Sheffield. Georgia Mountain, if you know what if Vermont looks like this, we're here. <laughs> Georgia Mountain is right north of here. You can actually see the Georgia turbines from the town here, or from Williston. This is a project called Kingdom Community Wind. Uh, it's also called the Lowell Project. This is Sheffield. And then there's no projects in the middle of the state. There's a lot of protected land in the middle of the state. In the southern part of the state, there's the Searsburg Project. And then right on the state border, there's a brand new project went into a line called the Husa project. And all told, I think that's about 140 megawatts. And that is generating about 10%, if I, 10% or more with all the other, you know, wind turbines, um, of our electric energy supplies here in Vermont. These are the slides I uh, brought along just to give you an idea of what's involved in developing a wind project and what it looks like. Earlier, you see, these are all on Georgia Mountain up north of here. And earlier, um, the last summer, we started the project construction by building roads. And you can see the roads you need aren't, aren't little back roads. They're, they're pretty substantial roads, and at Georgia, we needed over two and a half miles of them. So you have, first off, a road construction project. And then once you get your roads in, and you know where you want to put your wind turbines, you build a foundation. And this is the foundation. It's metal rods, rebar that will be encased with concrete. 
and that will support the wind turbine. These white bars are anchors, they're called rock anchors, and they go 40 feet into the bedrock. And there's um, about 18 of them that hold the foundation down to the ground. Um, also unique here in this project is the, um, the rotor blades for this project arrived in October and they arrived in downtown Burlington if you're familiar with the bike path in downtown along the lake and they came in on a train and so we had four turbines three blades a turbine so we had 12 blades come in and to give you an idea of the scale of how big these blades are, they're 50 meters long. But this is out at the exit 12, out uh, here, out here somewhere. They moved the blades from downtown Burlington up to the site at nighttime because they were going to have to interfere with traffic. And the, so the state gave them permission to take them through Burlington on special vehicles. You can see there's wheels back here and then the trucks up here and the blade is pretty much supporting itself in between and you can see how big it is by the size of the cars. They're big. Once you get them up to the top of the mountain you have to assemble them the big components that have arrived, almost everything requires special transportation trucks. So transportation is a major is a major part of planning for a project. Um, you can see it takes quite a bit of area to assemble the rotor when it's down because it's assembled flat. And then it's hoisted up with a huge crane to take it up to the top. Um, this is where it's headed. Up to the top, these are people awaiting the rotor that the crane is, is hoisting up there. Um, once you get the rotors on, um, this is another rotor assembly process. You can see the size of this relative to the workers at the bottom there. It's, it's pretty big. Um, we also have had some school teachers and some high school students come up during construction. We try to bring as many people up as we can, even though it's a construction zone. Uh, and uh, that we hope to have an open house at this facility uh, as soon as the snow goes away this spring. This is a picture of the completed project. The turbines were up uh, in December this past December. We had to have the turbines running by the end of the year and we actually did it. Uh, we put the <laughs> turbines into service, into work uh, on the last day of the year. So we made it. This is New Year's and they're all running. So that's my presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I can do questions for a while. <laughs> yes. How long has your business been like running? Thirty-three years. I started in 1978. Yes. Will the technology used in the wind turbines advance within? Years. Yeah. Uh, these turbines are the most advanced in the state. There's there's no gearbox in them, and there's only 23 or 25 moving parts in the nacelle instead of hundreds the way there was just a couple years ago. Yes. How much does each blade cost? Each blade, yeah. I think it's around a hundred thousand dollars, and you have three of them. 
Yes. When you have wind turbines on the property of a home, does it affect resale value? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm aware there's been several studies done on that, but they have not concluded that they do. Part of the problem is the real estate market has been so <laughs> up and down lately, it's hard to relate it to what's causing the ups and downs. Yes? Um, how many wind turbines has your company put up around the market? Well, we've been involved in four, probably about 32. Yes? Um, does your company build the turbines? No. In fact, we don't really handle the hardware at all. We just organize it and manage it. Yes? Where are the turbine components made? Uh, all around the world. All around the world. These turbines here, the towers came from Arkansas. No, the towers came from Tennessee. The blades came from Arkansas. The generator came from China. And almost all large wind turbines have have that type of international mix these days. Yes? The first project we did, we did for Green Mountain Power, and it was done in, in 1997. It was at that time the largest wind facility uh, on the East Coast, and it had 11 turbines, and they were half as high as this that they would be in here. How old were you guys in 1997? <laughs> yes. Um, since most greenhouse gases come from cars and automobiles, why are people trying so hard to um, put up turbines since they're never going to replace fossil fuels? Um, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, that. Developing renewable energy is a state goal. In fact, the state of Vermont has the goal of 90% of its energy coming from renewable sources by the year 2050. That seems like a ways off, but it's, it's pretty close, actually, if you have to convert all that. So what's going to happen is in the vision of most people now, in the state level and the national level, but particularly the state level, is automobile usage will will have electric automobiles. We're going to use more electricity, but less energy overall. And the electricity is going to come from renewable sources. So we're going to, in effect, have renewable powered cars. Yes. Uh, how many years did it take to even this project? Did this one? Yes. Six. It takes a while. In fact. Um, do you think that wind turbines will produce money for saving the home? No, well, they do right now. They pay the state taxes, and those taxes. Um, I think I had that here. Or about $1 million a year right now goes to the state education fund. So it's eventually coming back to the schools. Yes? Um, like how many sites have you built like? We're almost always on the top. On the projects I've been involved with, we're on the top of the ridge line. Yes. Um, do you do you think that most people like turbines or dislike dislike them? Most people like them. Yes. 
How do you view solar and hydropower? Very favorably. I think if we're going to get 90% of our energy, and I say energy, that's not electricity, that's what we use to power our cars and what we use to heat our homes and buildings and our electricity. If we're going to get 90% of that from renewables, we got to change the way we, we do things. And it's not going to be done by any one thing. It's not going to be done by wind power alone. You're going to need solar and you're going to need wind, and you're going to need hydro, and you're going to need energy conservation, and you're going to need it all, and you're going to need it fast. Yes? Do you have another project in progress? Mm, not in this state. Yes. Uh, could the wind turbines be built any smaller while still? No. <laughs> the amount of the power that comes out of a wind turbine is related to how big of a swept area the rotor turns in. Because you're actually extracting the power from a moving, flowing fluid, air. And so if you have a little rotor, you get a little power. <laughs> yes? Uh, what is the biggest project you've ever, your company has ever worked on? We, we did one that went into service in uh, northern New Hampshire that was 99 megawatts. It was 33 wind turbines. It's the largest wind project in New Hampshire. Yes? Um, do you think it's worth setting up wind turbines in a spot where there'd only be like one or two? Yeah, there are some onesies and twosies around, uh, particularly in Massachusetts there is. The, the problem with that is that by the time you get roads and power lines built, it's worthwhile to put as many wind turbines in there as you can. And that makes it more economical. Yes? Um, are turbines the most productive type of green energy in your I think they're going to be, yeah, I think they're going to be the largest, wind turbines are going to be the largest source of renewable power in the foreseeable future. So, uh, in this state. Solar is going to be two and it's coming on big right now and we need them both. Yes. Uh, do you think that the wind turbines destroy the ecosystem? No, I think they help the ecosystem. I think burning fossil fuels destroys the ecosystem. Yes. <laughs> Does the benefit of wind turbines outweigh the work it takes to get them? Well, you yes. If you if you end up having a successful project, that is, the wind turbines work, and you put them out a windy area. It's a, it's a benefit to society and to the owners. Yes. Has your company ever built wind turbines that haven't worked and succeeded in producing power from the No. I've, I've been lucky enough, all the ones that I've been working, they're all working. They're still spinning. <laughs> yes? There are wind turbines that have been built off coastlines. Is there any chance you'd build turbines on Lake Champlain? I don't want to say no to that. But I don't know of anybody that's looking at it. Uh, Lake Champlain is not too windy of an area. You've got to get up a, on a hill. Yes? How many projects can you company with? Ooh. Hundreds. In the sense that when I started out, I showed you how we would look for all the best sites over a large area, well, all the best sites end up being very many, like hundreds. So when we start to look at them really carefully, we eventually get those hundreds narrowed down to, say, a dozen. But that's the process we use. And of those dozen, there might only be two of them eventually get wind turbines. So we start off with a whole lot, and we get down to a very few of which actually get an operating wind project. <laughs> Do you think placing wind turbines offshore is a better alternative to the fact that they're kind of out of sight? 
Well, you're assuming people don't like to look at them, and that's not necessarily yes. the case. Uh, I don't I don't know that much about offshore, but I do know that even the ones that were proposed offshore down off the New England coast have had their problems with visual. The people who own the big houses on the coastline don't want to look out for five miles and see big wind turbines. Have you been involved in any coastline building? No, I haven't. I'm going to give you only two more questions. Oh, okay. I'll take one of you guys. On average, how much power does each turbine produce? On average? Uh, on average? Yeah. Well, these are uh, two, two and a half megawatt turbines. Four of them produce the electric energy needs of about 4,200 houses. Four thousand. So one turbine does about a thousand houses, approximately. Yes. Um, how do wind turbines affect wildlife? Well, they affect wildlife. It's not the turbines so much that affect the wildlife, as in, in as much as the um, the road construction, because you're you're actually constructing new corridors through a forest and that can be disruptive to certain types of wildlife that like to have continuous forests. The impacts aren't, but we spend a lot of time and on behalf of our clients a lot of money studying the wildlife impacts and uh, to date, we really haven't come up with any findings that shows there's that significant of an impact on wildlife, but it always gets looked at. So, I wonder, you know, you can see that there are still questions, but we're going to need to rotate. Do you mind if I send you an email with a bunch of questions? Do you want to say following up if they still don't get answered? After they look through some of your materials to send anything to me? Yeah, I am going to, you had a lot of questions of what the wind projects are. I have some sheets here you can have. Uh, I don't have enough for everybody, and I will send it to you electronically, Deborah. I'll have them available in the class so kids can refer to them instead of preparing their own thoughts. Good. Yeah, good. Well, that was, that was a great question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, students, you're going to take your